this talk. Um, Justin, um, as many of you know, is a professor at York University. It's something completely different than the topic of this talk. He writes scientific papers on forest fires, which is impressive in and of itself, but he's also never let his moral and political conscience die. And so, uh, I mean that as a joke, but, um, and so he's developed this other side of himself, which is to go to different parts of the world, research them, and write reports which break through the mainstream co lack of coverage <coughs> in the years. So how often have you seen mainstream coverage of Kashmir, Chhattisgarh, the Congo, etc.? Places that you don't find covered, you find just it has, might have been there, might have written about it, and in a very thoughtful way. Right? So we're very lucky to have an intellectual like him, who's both in the university doing other stuff, but also kind of keeping, um, doing good journalistic and research work on a very important parts of the world. This talk is going to focus on India and maybe a bit on Pakistan, I believe. Um, he'll let you know what format he wants, whether it's going to be question also or multimedia, etc. Um, what else did I want to say? Nothing else to do. Uh, I hope you have a great discussion and then I'll moderate questions. Development Fund, the PDF, for hosting this, right? I'm not from Pakistan, but I've been to a couple of, I've been outside a couple of places in the window, and I'm also impressed that 30, 40 young Pakistani students are talking about development issues, political issues of their country, <coughs> in a such an engaged and rational and honest way to learn something. And so when I thought of, let's have Justin speak, I, there's no Indian student group I can go to to say, pause oh, this. So I went to the Pakistan group and said, will we post it? They said, yes. They didn't know who I was, and they said, yes. <laughs> right? So I'm really impressed with PDF's um, commitment to rational discussion and engaged discussion and so on. OK. Uh, thanks, Sarah. And thanks again to the Pakistan Development Fund for hosting me. And thank you all for coming on a nice, very nice uh, evening in the summertime. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about today was India. I was in India, based in Delhi, teaching uh, international politics at Jamia Millia Islamia in the winter term, so January through April, and uh, in the political science department. A lot of my students were Kashmiris, which was really, um, which was really great, you know, to have to have to be able to talk to students that whose voices are marginalized, I think it's fair to say, in India and who are fairly systematically silenced um, in a lot of ways that I'll actually talk about in a few more minutes. Uh, while I was based in Delhi, I, I, I had one lecture a week, so I got to do something that I don't think most Indians can do, which was take advantage of the fact that I could just jet off somewhere and get on one of these flights. and. And so I traveled within India a fair bit. I went to Kerala, which is where my parents are from. And I went to Chhattisgarh, which is what I'm going to talk about first. Um, and I went to Kashmir, and I went to a few other places. Uh, to, you know, the, the Chhattisgarh and the Kashmir trips were really to try to learn a bit more about the politics and see what was going on um, so that I could do things like this, talk about it, and write about it. Um, the big picture of India, and I know, you know, I, I'm hoping, uh, what I would like to do is talk for a, a few minutes and then maybe we can have some di dialogue for a few minutes and then I can show a video if you haven't already seen it, some footage that I took from a march uh, of the Adivasi Mahasabha in, uh, in March in, in Dantevada and an interview with one of the leaders of that group, uh, Manish Kunjam, which I think might be of interest to the folks here. So, but the big picture in India right now is that India is, India has all of the things that the rest of the world has. You know, it's, 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 you can't really have a, an understanding or a critique of India that's not also a critique of humanity. It's a huge chunk of humanity that lives there. And everything that, that we have everywhere else in the world, India has. It has sexism and patriarchy, it has racism, it has class division, it has hierarchy, it has caste, it has some things other parts of the world don't have. It has the religious divisions and communal divisions and all of this is playing out in, um, 
in, a, in the context of, I think, a, a gigantic experiment that, I don't, that has never been attempted on, a, on the scale that it's occurring in India today. And that it, the experiment is, the, the question is, can you take several hundred million people from poverty to some kind of Western, first world, middle class life while simultaneously leaving behind 800 million or more people to total misery. And that is the experiment that if you go to India, you can see playing out. You can see it playing out in the urban areas and you can see it playing out in the countryside. But where you can really see it is if you look at numbers, if you look at demographics, if you look at budgets, sure. so if you look at if things you, like if you profits take this and accumulation, central, and this if you portion look of in central India, places. which is covered so by a forest, the Chhattis. Again, I, I apologize for telling people things they already know, but there's a big forest. In central east India that covers a number of states uh, called the Dandakaranya Forest. It's a temperate, um, fairly dry forest. And in that, for in that forest is a large portion of India's Adivasi population. And most of you know what Adivasis are, but if, if you're familiar with the Canadian context, Adivasis are India's indigenous people. And it's a, it's a it's an interesting kind of anthropological question to think of what an indigenous person or an indigenous identity or an indigenous culture means in a context like India that's been, it's an, you know, what you, the phrase you always hear is an ancient civilization. So India is an ancient civilization. So what are these Adivasis? <coughs> well, Adivasis are people who have had contact with this civilization for ever, for hundreds or thousands of years, but who have always had a kind of different mode of production, a different way of earning a livelihood, a different way of uh, relating to the natural ecosystem and to society. So today, Adivasis depend on forest, the forest's products. They live much more simply than um, even than the peasant, um, farmer, people who live in the villages much, that are much more connected, even, even if they're in relative terms isolated. So what you, one thing to understand about India, or South Asia in general, is that the le there are many, many levels of hierarchy. So it's, a, it's an incredibly variegated kind of hierarchy. The top is as high as anything you can imagine multi-billionaires, the largest home in the world, right, is in, in the most expensive single dwelling in the world is owned by the Ambani's and it's in Mumbai and it overlooks one of the largest slums in the world. Um, so that's, those are the extremes, but in fact the slum that is overlooked, that the Ambani's house overlooks is not the floor of India. It gets poorer in India than even that <coughs> slum. There are worse conditions even than that slum and and so the, the sheer scale of hierarchy is kind of hard to, hard to grasp, but it's important to remember when you're trying to understand a situation or a context like India's. The Adivasis that live in, the, in these forests, they make their living from things, from collecting things like tandu leaves, which become uh, the, the rolls of cigarettes or um, fruit, which becomes uh, mahua, which is like a kind of a beer, which I got to try in Nantewara. Um, and, and so they make their living in the forest and are dependent on the forest to, to be intact for their survival. And this is unfortunate because like other indigenous people throughout the Americas and elsewhere, these forests are desired by large corporations that have their own designs on not only the forest, but also <coughs> what's underneath them. So some of the richest aluminum, some of well, the national richest iron ore, some of these, um, all of these territories have for some kind of been resource assigned. So this is, some, this is familiar to people from, 
from Latin America. I mean, it was familiar. to me, uh, having studied Colombia a little bit, or Canada, right? People who know the situation in the Canadian North, or any Ontario's North, any of these, any of these uh, contexts are, understand that there's this conflict between indigenous people and, um, and multinational capital that, that is trying to s turn nature into profits at the fastest possible rate, which Canada has actually specialized in for some time. Um, so that's one major uh, conflict between the indigenous people and corp the multinational capital, but, it, but it's not just between indigenous people. In fact, um, the, this, is, this project, can, is, is incompatible with not, it's incompatible with, with more than just the indigenous way of life. It's incompatible with, in a way, any kind of way of life. And it's certainly incompatible with a project that would, that can ensure the survival of a population the size of India's and the scale of India's. Uh, in order to, in order to secure that kind of future is going to take some serious rethink, you know, some serious thinking and some serious rethinking uh, well beyond, I mean, well beyond the kind of impulse to extract, which is, which is the primary goal of, of India in these, in these areas. Um, now, in terms of resistance to this model, <coughs> there are different things going on. And, and I, I know there are different opinions in, the, in this room about, about the best way to resist. Um, and I, I just want to, I, I want to raise a few, I'll, I'll just talk about what I saw. Um, on the one hand, there is an armed resistance to the encroachment of these corporations. So the, the corporations are not, they didn't just decide on their own initiative to go into these areas. They are going in with the full backing of the state. They're going in with the backing of politicians. They're going in with the, with the, with the state and, and national um, police and military apparatus. And so this is a militarized attempt to take over these territories. And uh, with that kind of force, it's not entirely surprising that the response is going to take some kind of armed form. So in the, in the context of uh, Chhattisgarh especially, but also this whole entire forest, um, there have be, there, the, there's an armed struggle uh, led by the, what are called the Naxalites or the Indian Mal, the Communist Party of India Maoist. Um, and, and, and so there's a kind of a debate in India on the left about whether this armed strategy is the most productive strategy or not. Um, and people I respect ha have both positions. There are people that I really respect that think it's a fundamentally flawed and bankrupt strategy, and there are people that I respect that think that it's possibly the only thing that's uh, salvaged what territory has not already been lost. So we can, I'd, you know, I'd be interested to hear people's, people's thoughts on that. One argument that I thought was interesting to consider that I would, that I would like to throw out um, is the idea that some of the, like, an idea of trying to use the, con the contradictions or the possibilities of an electoral system. So where, where are the limits of India's electoral democracy? At what point do you say, we can't use this anymore and we have to work entirely outside of this system versus saying we have to use 
the laws that exist. We have to use the electoral options that exist. So that's, a, that's an interesting question for us in Canada. It's an interesting question in the States. And it's an interesting question in um, India. It might start to be, hopefully, an interesting question in Pakistan, um, you know, since you just had an election that was sort of this heralded as the big turnover of one elected government to another, which you know, happened without a, a coup. So maybe they'll, maybe, maybe they go, yeah, that deserves applause, doesn't it? Maybe, maybe there'll, maybe there'll be that kind of question um, that can arise in, in Pakistan. So um, one, one person uh, that I read, Nirmalang Shu Mukherjee, he, he, he writes in, in one of his books um, the idea that if the laws like the Rural Employment Guarantee, um, the Forest Rights Act, if various of these, law, these highly progressive Le legislation were actually implemented, <coughs> that would constitute a virtually a revolutionary change in Indian society. Um, and, and so you don't actually need new laws. You, you have the legislative tools that you need to mobilize. So the question is, can you, do you use these or, you know, how do you, how do you struggle in a, in a, in a Democrat or nominally democratic context in which there you have this massive um, massive what in the states progressives called money power right you have this immense kind of capitalist uh, onslaught that's occurring and a concentration of power a plutocracy caste hierarchy all of these other things that prevent real democracy from occurring, but per perhaps provide openings or opportunities for the people to take back or take um, things. So one problem with democracy is that in a society like India, that's that's so divided, ge including geographically, any one of these states can or territories can be isolated, and any any one of them by itself doesn't have the demographic weight to count for very much in a democratic system, in an electoral system. So, you if you think about about Chhattisgarh, it's it's twenty some million people. That just that amounts to a very small that doesn't amount to a very large electoral block in a country like India. Twenty million people in Canada would be a big deal. Twenty million people in India is not a big deal, uh, and and this is even more, I'd say, a problem in a context like Kashmir. So Kashmir, I think, has in part been very successfully isolated. By, by the Indian state because of its, the, the small size demographically and the inability to bring any kind of Process electoral power to bear. Partition um, in when Kashmir became a um, part of India <clears throat> through this there whole... There were, again, a series of laws that, that gave Kashmir a various... Degrees of autonomy. Same with uh, same with the Adivasis, by the way. There's the Schedule Five and Schedule Six of the Constitution, which are always uh, much debated and discussed. They provide a, a quite a bit of room for indigenous autonomy in within the Indian Constitution, but of course, they are superseded by the mining interests. The same way that the duty to consult in Canada is superseded by the Mining Act, wherever uh, the two seem to come into conflict. Similarly, Kashmir, there's Article 370, there's a whole framework for Kashmir to have a, a significant degree of autonomy within India, but um, it hasn't actually been granted that. Instead, Kashmir has gotten the worst of all possible worlds. 
on the one hand, it's, it's got this massive military presence, uh, which India claims, you know, at some, of, some percentage of which of this claim is plausible, that they're the border with, they have a border with Pakistan, they have a border with China, some of those troops would be there. But then it, the claim falls apart when you realize that Indian troops are also you know, in an Austrian guard and, and force. well inland from so, those borders um, and constituting a kind of On the one hand, there's this militarized, massive presence of the Indian state. And on the other hand, there, that presence is used to make it almost impossible for Kashmiris to travel freely, say, to the other part of Kashmir, which is in Pakistan, or even to um, communicate with each other. They do things in Kashmir that I didn't even know were possible. Um, like, when I landed in Kashmir and I started texting my friends and contacts and none of the texts were returned, I thought, oh, that's too bad, so I'll give them a call. And, I, and then I was told, well, your SIM card is not going to work. It's Kashmir. Your Indian SIM card is not going to work. And then I thought, okay, well, I'll just do what I do in any other part of India and get a SIM card, right? Well, no, you can't get your own SIM card in Kashmir. Somebody has to get it. So somebody got me a SIM card, and I started texting with that. And then, again, my texts weren't returned. So I said, well, I asked the guy who gave me the phone, what's going on? He said, you can't text in Kashmir. There's no texting in Kashmir. The texting in Kashmir stopped in 2010. So the, th the things that, that um, you can do in other parts of India in terms of communication can just be shut down. So in the past few days, the Indian security forces killed four uh, people in, in, in the valley. Um, and whenever they do this, whenever they kill some people in Kashmir, they also shut down their communications. They also put them under curfew. Um, and all of these things are, are done under the claim that India has to, that Kashmir is an integral part of India. So Kashmir is an integral part of India. Therefore, we have to prevent them from communicating like any other part of India, or none of the, all of the all of the things that are done in order to maintain Kashmir as an integral part of India are things that have the effect of totally isolating Kashmiris from the rest of India. Um, and the big thing that happened while I was in uh, India in February was the execution of Afzal Guru, and that was a moment where the Kashmiris that I talked to said, you know, I, I thought, a lot of people said things like, you know, after 2010, there were these demonstrations in 2010, right? There were like a, a lot of pretty much nonviolent demonstrations that were brutally suppressed by the Indian military. They killed about 100 boys, pretty much a lot of them were children. Um, and and there were people who said, you know, after 2010, I, I, I thought I, I, I was kind of giving up on, on, on hope in a way. But I thought that I thought that we could at least have some kind, like they would at least like they leave us alone. But then the execution of Afzal Guru was so gratuitous. It was so, and it was done in such a such a contemptuous way like they 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 sent a letter to his family and said you know it didn't get there uh it got there after he was executed so they read about his execution in the papers it was like years after his arrest right like 12 years after his arrest or something and it was done in secret and he was buried in secret so it was all just and 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 the evidence against of what are called guy. surrender and if you militants. follow the history so surrender of militants of is like if you look back at the story category, it's the Kashmir story of so won. many independents like and so when when there's when in the 90s when there was an armed struggle 
there were a hu there were huge numbers of, of people in relative terms because Kashmir is again a small state. It's got a small population, um, but huge numbers of people joined the movement. And after joining the movement, there was this claim that there would be amnesty. And amnesty itself is a questionable framework for this, right? Like, what was the what was the punishment for all the um, war crimes that were committed against the Kashmir? You know, obviously there's not there's there's no question of amnesty for that. But but there's a claim that there's amnesty, so militants would surrender um, to become to try to join the mainstream and and get out of this kind of stigma of militancy and, and lay down their arms. Um, and, and that became a, a way of entrapping these young men for whatever the state wanted to, to do. And in, in whether it was like using them as informants or actually using them to entrap uh, other people, you know, to build this network that, of, that kind of destroys trust and destroys solidarity and undermines the foundation of society that all occupiers do, but that in a, in a context where India is claiming that this is an integral part of a, a, in a democratic country, it's not supposed to be doing this kind of thing, right? It's not supposed to be behaving the way occupiers behave. So Afzal Guru was an example of this. He was a surrendered militant who, who, who ended up being executed in this you know, gigantic, incredibly long and horrifying ordeal about which there are the, you know, vastly suspicious and, and huge unanswered questions. As there are about a lot of um, what are called these encounter killings of militants all over the country. The other thing about the surrendered militants that's worth mentioning is if this is what India is doing with surrendered militants, then how is India going to claim that what the Naxalites should do is lay down their arms and join the, the democratic struggle, right? So I met people, again, I met, uh, the interview that I did was with Manish Kunjam, the Adivasi Mahasabha, and they operate on the theory that, that they should use the democratic system, that they're trying to, to operate within the electoral framework and, and mass mobilization. Um, but you know, even there, they're they're not they're not saying, you know, let's do this and also Indian state repress the Maoists. Like th this is a it's a situation where where the Indian state is not discriminating between armed and unarmed opposition. And so, what does that mean? And that that's something I heard in Kashmir a lot. Like, what's, what lesson are we supposed to take when we surrender and this is what happens um, when, when, our, when we were told that you should, we should proceed along the democratic route and, and, and then they do these incredibly humiliating things. After they, so this was just, just one last point about Afzal Guru. Um, it was not just a, a humiliation of Afzal, right? So, so immediately when they executed Afzal, they also imposed a curfew. They didn't wait for anything to happen in Kashmir. They imposed a curfew right away. They blocked communications right away. They shut down the internet right away. Um, why, why did they do that if they, like it, it conflicts with their claim that this was the, the progress of justice, right? If it was just the progress of justice, they shouldn't have had anything to fear. And they certainly shouldn't have been closing down all the communications. Um, so I guess just to conclude this part, and then we can probably discuss, what I, what I think we should talk about is, um, or what I, I to start the discussion with is, you know, a, lo a, lot of, uh, a lot of you know a lot about Pakistan. And uh, I, think, I think there's, I didn't really touch on the, the role of, of 
Pakistan and the, the relationship between India and Pakistan uh, and, the, and that, what, that, what that has to do with what that, the effects of that on Kashmir. I, I, was, in, in, I was in the Indian, Indian occupied side of Kashmir. Um, but I, but I did talk to, I have a friend, Farooq uh, Suleria from Viewpoint, and he was in Delhi at the same time as me. So we got to talk and discuss a lot of um, things and compare notes, because he, he had a, an interesting pa kind of Pakistani perspective. Um, so, you know, what, what, what should friends of both these countries be thinking about? you know, going forward. And then the, the other question is about resistance. So what, what do you think strategies make sense in a context like India's where there is some kind of electoral system, where there is some kind of legitimacy for that electoral system contested um, as it is? Uh, how do you, how, how do we try to how do we try? It? What's the answer for that, for people who, you know, believe in equality, uh, for, pe for people who believe in democracy, and uh, want to see these conflicts come to a peaceful and just conclusion? So, how about we? Do you want to? 